Turn those cell phones off. Put them on stand. Okay. What some of you know the drill here, this is a sign up sheet. If you can sign up, that would be great. We get our act together, we might send you our schedule now and again, or once a year or something. Um, also, um, Patagonia and Freeport helps support this series, which costs us a lot to put on, actually. And uh, to incentivize a donation for a door prize, when well, they donate a door prize, so here it's a nice thing with a hood on it, good for cold weather. Uh, and what you do, if you'd like to be eligible for that, take a piece of scrap paper, write your name on it, five bucks or something in the basket, put the slip of your name in the teddy bear tin. And, uh, Gary will have a, Gary will pick a winner. Sure. So, <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, I'm Ed Friedman. I chair Friends of Marine Bay. Thank you for coming. This is our like 22nd year of doing this. And uh, probably keep going, I guess. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're a unique organization in that we, we are, we protect land. We protect over 1,500 acres around the bay, 12 miles or so of, of uh, short front wetland areas. Uh, we do uh, education with the local schools, a couple of outdoor bay days every year, um, in-school visits during the year, uh, bay days. Uh, we have about 500 kids come full between the two of them, fourth grade mostly. Got some three-fold things over there that, that show some of the areas that we work in. We do a lot of active research stuff. Uh, this year we did a big archaeology dig up in Dresden, the most significant prehistoric site in the state. And, uh, and we also did an update, a 10-year update on vegetation changes, uh, aquatic vegetation changes in the bay over time and land use changes around the bay. And we did the flying for that. We worked with James Sewell out of Old Town on that over the years. Uh, first time this work had ever been done when we did it the first time, which was in, I think, 1996, uh, taking old historical aerial photography data turning it into geographic information system stuff, updating it, and doing analysis over time. So we go back to uh, 1956 for the Bay Area. 56, uh, 81, 96, 2008 or 9, and then this year. So, And then we do a lot of hardcore advocacy as well. And, uh, a lot of it around fish passage, around hydro dams. I've been working with colleagues at Friends of the Sebago Lake a lot the last year or so on the Brazilian Cup River, where um, they're about to, they have disposed the whole watershed off to uh, migratory fish in exchange for better fish passage in Westbrook for a short distance. So it's not dead yet, but it's, it, it doesn't look good for, for the fish. So anyway. Um, and most of our work involves volunteers, and we're very, we're really fortunate uh, amongst groups that do any kind of work. We have a high percentage of our members are, all, are active volunteers. There's a bunch in this room right now. Uh, it's, it's upwards of, it's, it's over 30% of people are volunteers, which is great. So typically only have one staff person. Um, this event is the second Wednesday of each month, October to May. Uh, Next month it'll be actually not here. It's a combination with a great potluck supper that we do in January and a very brief annual meeting. Don't worry about it. You won't get bored to death. Um, and we have our elections. But our speaker will be Bunny McBride, who's a very well-known uh, anthropologist. And her, her husband, Harold Prince, archaeologist. They live over in Bath, but they teach at Kansas State. And she's written quite a few books, um, generally around women and Native Americans. And one of those is called Women of the Dawn. And she's going to sing the name of the program, Women of the Dawn. So it should be fun. So Gary over here is a state horticulturist. In the past, he's run the yardscaping program with the state. He's been the director of the uh, um, uh, Bureau of Pesticides, Board of Pesticides Control. And uh, got a BS in forestry and wildlife management from UMO. And he's been a licensed professional forester since the mid-'80s. Also an avid photographer, a nature photographer, landscape photographer, and uh, attributes his love of plants to his mom. For sure. Yeah. So, 
think with that, have at it. Right? All right. Well, thanks, and, uh, Ed. Since you're going to cruise around, yeah. put that on somewhere. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Everybody hear me okay? So I did bring some handouts if you didn't get them. There's a, a jumping worm field guide here. And uh, then all the slides if you're interested in that. And then one of the things that I have to deal with right now is emerald ash borer. So there's some information on emerald ash borer as well as the little card that gives you kind of the how to identify it and, and so on, which if you're interested in that, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities to learn about it over the next couple of years and probably five or ten years and then there's some tick spoons over here feel free to take one of those since you're right in the heart of tick country down here that's for sure so yeah I am the state horticulturist I've only been in that position for a couple of years before that I worked for the Board of Pesticides Control for 28 years and you know basically crazy worms is a subject that kind of came up two or three years ago we found some in pots that were at a nursery where you know they were just growing plants and you pick up the pot and then there's this crazy worm underneath it and so I started wondering about that and found that there's been a lot of research done both in Wisconsin as well as Vermont and especially looking at sugar maple forests and the effects on sugar maple forests and you know worms we've all always been taught that worms are good right well you know maybe not so but you know basically I've learned a lot I've read a lot of papers I'm trying to understand you know is this a big risk or not it may or may not be where the risk really lands is with certain types of forests and with certain types of plants which I'll talk more about but you know we've always been taught that earthworms are you know good they compost waste they provide all kinds of food for you know robins and things like that they you know recycle organic material they provide some fertilization or at least the mixing of nutrients and bringing them up and down. So, you know, are they good for the environment? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, they, they are good for certain types of gardens where you're growing certain types of, of plants, but they're an invasive species. All earthworms are invasive species in, in Maine because glaciation killed them all. And then all the plants that we have now co-evolved without earthworms. And they have moved in primarily from Europe and also from Asia and some from um, the southern states. But pretty much the invasive ones are all, you know, from, from Europe and, and Asia, especially Japan, Korea, uh, those areas. And earthworms, you know, they really upset soil chemistry, some more than others. And they can make it very difficult for some native plants to, to thrive. And... They definitely are causing damage to forests. You can see it if you go to Viles Arboretum in Augusta. There's an area where they have the ash um, plantation. And if you go, you know, walk out there and look around, you'll see that all the roots of the trees are above ground because of these Asian worms. And, you know, so unfortunately now, you know, we're learning that, that worms aren't what we always thought they were. So, you know, definitely wherever there was uh, the glaciation lost all the earthworms and plants evolved without earthworms after that. And the thing about worms is that they can reproduce in so many different ways. You know, they're, they're hermaphrodites, they're polygamous, and uh, they're parthenogenic. So they can, you know, they can produce all on their own. You only need one to have a, a big population start, unfortunately. And, you know, they, this is how they mate. And there are th three different kind of types of earthworms that are out there. There's the epigeics, which live in the litter. They don't go down into the soil very much, like the red wiggler that a lot of people talk about using for composting. They like to live within the organic matter. They don't like to go down into the soil. So they're, they're kind of at the top. And then the endogeics, they, they're in the soil. They're not up in the duff. They, they stay in the soil. And then you've got the anesics that actually go deep down, like the, the night crawlers that go deep down and mix the soil. And, and those are you know, really good for our vegetable gardens. And the crazy worm or the amenthus worms, they're basically kind of a combination of epigeic and endogeic. They're mostly in the litter, but they do stay at the very top of the topsoil. So that's one of the things that uh, is a characteristic that you'll see that's different from, from other worms. 
And you know, they've been around for quite a long time. Uh, we've actually you know, had reports of them back in the 1900s, but they really haven't you know, taken off and developed large populations, established populations until the last you know, 10 or 15 years. And so th they're starting to show up in, in a lot of different areas uh, in North America as well as Central America and Europe. And they're, they're definitely here in Maine as well. And so, you know, the, the European earthworms, they kind of came in first. This is a new invasion of, of Asian earthworms. And one of the things that you'll see as I go through is that they're actually kind of taking over in the places where they get established. They, they, kind, they seem to be uh, the, the worm bullies. They, they knock out the, the European earthworms. And one of the ways to, you know, basically tell the difference is, you know, if you look at this section of the, of the worm here, um, it's, it's a white band, it's not raised on, on the amenthus worms. And is that going to sleep? <laughs> Looks like it got a little bit lighter, but. And the species that we're talking about are mostly amenthus species. So they're called jumping worms, crazy worms, Alabama jumpers. They're actually out there being sold as fish bait and they get mixed into composting worms at times. And that's a, that's a big issue where people aren't actually getting the worms that they think that they're getting. They're getting you know, something else that's mixed in and that's, that's unfortunate. So you know, these worms are definitely a, a, an issue. People have you know, found them in, in big kind of balls and, and they're wiggling all around like snakes and they get excited about them and they, and they call about them. And we've had a few calls here in Maine. They've had a lot in Vermont and Wisconsin where they've been doing you know, more of the research and they've actually kind of had news reports on them and people you know, know to be looking for them. And when they find them, they, they find that they're, they're crazy. I mean, they're, they're really wiggling around and like snakes and they're a lot more active than your typical earthworm that is from Europe. So that's just you know, some pictures of some of them. So again, the, the clitellum, which is the part of the reproductive system of the, of the worm on an amenthus worm, on, on a snake worm, it, it isn't raised, even though this picture kind of makes it look it, like it's raised, but it isn't. And it goes all the way around. It's a it, you know, very smooth, very whitish kind of color, milky color, and it wraps all the way around. And they are um, very active. They move like a snake. If you pick them up by their tail, they'll actually wiggle off and, and lose their tail to get away. So they have that as a, a flight mechanism. You say that's where the digestive system is? Well, the, this is the reproductive system. This, yeah, and, and this is the head up here. So if you pick them up by the tail, they'll, they'll let their tail go to, to survive. And as I said, they're, they're parthenogenic, they're asexual. Um, it only takes one worm to start a, a big family. So that, that makes it you know, difficult to try to manage them. And there are two species, one that's much bigger, and this is the one that we've seen the most in Maine, is Amenthus agrestis. The Tokyoensis is one that has been found in Maine and has been found in Vermont as well as in Wisconsin. They're very difficult other than when they're mature to speciate because uh, they're very similar in terms of morphology other, otherwise. When, when one worm is reproducing, are they doing it purposefully or is it always by accident? <laughs> I think they're doing it purposely, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just part of their... To their it, right, it's just the way that they, they can procreate. Is the cotillon on the same segments on both of those worms? Yes. So the other thing about the biology with, with these worms is that um, they can reach maturity fairly quickly in 60 days, so they can have um, two hatches per season. And they will actually tolerate uh, soils that are, you know, all the way down to 5.0. If they um, get into really acidic soils, they don't do so well. So that, that helps us in some ways in that they're probably not going to be found in conifer forests, but they, you know, can definitely be found in, in hardwood forests. And one of the biggest problems with these is that they have a very voracious appetite. They, they basically go through the duff that's uh, on the forest floor very quickly, and they're very adaptive. They, they can overwinter no problem at all, even further north than Maine. 
Um, they overwinter as cocoons, which I'll show in a second. And they're, they're pretty um, adaptive to lots of different habitat types as long as that soil pH is high enough for them. And they produce a soil that's kind of like coffee grounds, basically. It's not like the worm castings that you normally see from the typical worms, the European worms that we have, where you'll see just a little mound that's the, the natural casting. With them, they, they just they, they make the soil into coffee grounds, basically. Yeah, it's basically as they um, pull the dirt and all of the uh, vegetative material through their digestive system, that's what's left behind, exactly. And as I mentioned before, they don't know the mechanism, but they seem to outcompete the European species. So they haven't, there's a lot of research being done right now on trying to figure out the extent of them, why they're doing so well in certain areas, and, and how to possibly manage them in the future. But uh, right now, a lot of uh, questions are, are unanswered. And, you know, as I mentioned, a single jumping worm cocoon, which there's one in here, which is, you know, impossible to see, could be in a potted plant. And by moving that potted plant and planting it somewhere, you could start a population with that single cocoon. And so the cocoons are really tiny. So, you know, you look at this, they're just a few millimeters. So, and this is another type, uh, the metifier is, is another species that's in this Asian uh, worm complex that sometimes is found together with these, with these other worms. So, you know, basically it looks like a grain of soil. So you, you can't really, you know, find them to be able to rid the pot or the, the soil of those, those cocoons. And this kind of shows one where they did find one in a bunch of soil. And this kind of shows the coffee ground appearance as well. But it's, um, it's amazing, you know, what they can do. And, you know, they do, they, they eat dirt and decaying organic material. So with these particular worms, because they're mostly at the surface, they're eating mostly the organic duff. So they're, they're feeding on all those fallen leaves and the rotting wood and everything else that's there, which provides the, planting ground for a lot of, of woodland plants and then provides a slow release of nutrients. And one of the big concerns, you know, with these particular worms is that as they go through that organic duff layer so quickly, they're spiking that soil with a lot of nutrients all at once and then it's gone. And then there's no more of that slow release of nutrients. And at the same time, that coffee ground soil tends to then pack down a little bit. And that's why in the end, you start seeing these roots that are above the ground, both the combination of not having the duff there, as well as the soil becoming a little bit more compacted. And you'll start to have root buttresses that are, that are above ground. And that's you know, not good for the trees. And it's taking away the, uh, the ability for a lot of those forest floor plants to develop at all because they, they don't have their seed bed anymore and it's, it's exposed. So, you know, research is definitely showing that it's changing the soil characteristics drastically. In terms of what happens in the long term, they're having a hard time teasing that out right now because a lot of the places where these worms are found are in forests that are already challenged with other invasive species like invasive plants for the most part. And so there have already been changes that have caused damage to the native plants. So it's hard to tease out what's being caused by the worms versus what's being caused by the other invasive plants and, and things like that that may be there. But it's definitely, they actually physically eat a lot of the seed bank. So as they go through that duff layer, they're eating the seeds of a lot of those uh, forest floor plants, the, the understory vegetation. And so you end up, instead of having a forest that has a lot of seedlings and things like that, you have the, the denser soils and you get basically um, a lot of, of grasses or a lot of sedges in a lot of areas. Or you get a lot of areas where there's nothing growing on the forest floor, especially if you've got a, a very mature forest that has basically little or no sunlight penetrating into the ground. So if those shade tolerant plants can't get a hold anymore, 
then you don't have anything there. So then you've got the potential for a lot of nutrient runoff, you've got you know, erosion problems, it, it you know, can compound in, in a lot of different ways. So you know, they're physically eating the seed bank, they're taking away the soil material that those, those plants need, and they're leaving behind a soil that's more compacted and, and not as, as good for things like sugar maples, where they're really concerned about these getting into the sugar bushes where you know, we produce a lot of, of, sugar, uh, of uh, maple syrup. So you know, definitely the research is showing that it has reduced the leaf litter a lot. Uh, it, it causes an initial increase in all the you know, nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the top couple of inches. But then that's quickly leached away is, is you know, what the, everybody expects to see. And you know, basically, they, they see some effects on the forest floor a lot more than in the prairie because this is a, a Midwestern paper. And you know, definitely a very um, de quick depletion of the litter layer and you know, mineralization of lots of nutrients. So it's, it doesn't sound good. Um, there's not a lot of sound science about it yet, but I suspect that most of the hypotheses are gonna turn out to be pretty much right. So, you know, when they do get in infested, you lose the leaf litter, you've got vulnerability to more invasive species. So, you know, you're losing those native plants. If there is enough sunlight there to allow a, a buckthorn or a Japanese barberry or something like that to get hold, then it's going to come in and take over the understory. And if you remove the overstory, you're just going to get all those invasive plants coming in very quickly and, and taking over the site. So you know, you're, you're losing diversity of both plants and animals and you know, that's, that's definitely not a good ecological situation. And there's a lot of concern that you know, these are probably the common invasive species that might end up in those, those niches where a lot of them can already tolerate the, the shade that's uh, in those areas you know, the, the buckthorn and the barberries especially, but uh, you know, pretty much all of these, the, the burning bush is one that can really tolerate the shade and will do very well in, in those types of situations. So unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of suspect that with more and more of these worms, we'll have even bigger problems with these invasive plants, which we already have lots of problems with in southern Maine especially, southern and central Maine. Not so much in down east or up north, but still they're there and um, present a, a potential threat. So in terms of the, the native species that might be lost, and you know, at this point there isn't a lot of research to show that this is actually happening, but my, I, you know, I suspect that we'll you know, lose a lot of things like the, the trilliums and the trout lilies and Solomon seal, which are all very dependent upon that duff, that organic duff as their seed bed, as the place where they grow, and they need to have that slow release of nutrients and that moisture to survive. And then um, on top of that, you lose the ground nesting birds because they don't have any cover anymore, and that um, you know, prevents that, that particular problem. Um, there is a, a spotted salamander where there is a paper on that where that actually has been shown to be drastically impacted by the worms coming in and, and basically taking away its, its harborage. So it has no place to produce its family, has no place to hide, and you know, it, it, it becomes a, a quick loss in those types of, of situations where you've got the crazy worms have completely taken away the organic duff and, and messed up the soil. So, you know, what is the problem? What can you do? You know, they're basically spread primarily through horticulture, unfortunately. So, you know, you, you'll have nurseries that are growing plants or you'll have people that are growing plants in their yard and they go to a plant swap sale or, or something like that. And they've got the pots, maybe they don't see any worms, but there may be cocoons in that soil. So that goes off somewhere else and and then people, you know, all of a sudden find that they've got these crazy worms and they've got weird things going on in their, their, their beds. And in some situations, they'll actually kill plants, especially hostas seem to be very sensitive to these worms. And I suspect that a lot of, again, those 
those shade loving plants, if you've got a shade garden and you get these, these worms into it, you're gonna have a problem with, with those plants. So, you know, definitely nurseries can potentially spread it. Uh, it's also spread in compost. So, you know, if it gets into a compost and it get, gets, you know, into like a municipal compost stream, then that could go out all over the place. And, you know, that, that's a potential concern. It also, they get into mulch and they love mulch and they'll, and they will feed and eat up the mulch very quickly where they have these in some of the uh, arboretums and, and other uh, commercial landscapes, they find that they go through mulch like crazy because these worms uh, eat it up so, so quickly. And so, you know, it can be a problem with that. And then once they get into the urban habitats, they can be, you know, sucked up into leaf piles and then who knows where those leaves go. You know, they maybe get composted and then they get um, given out to people in the town and, and they get spread around that way. And as I mentioned, you know, plant sales, it's pretty hard to tell whether there's anything in there. And then one area where we can really have a lot of effect is if you're out there fishing and you're using worms as bait, don't dump your worms out into the forest. When you're done with the worms, bring them home and dry them out, put them in the trash, make sure they're double bagged or whatever, make sure they're not going to some place where they're gonna go into compost and uh, you know, take care of them that way because they do end up in bait worms, they get mixed up into things, just as I mentioned earlier with some of the, the composting worms and so you've got to be really careful about any types of worms that we have and not letting them out into the environment, not out into the forest, especially. So does anything eat them? These worms tend to be fairly high in levels of, of, of lead and uh, you know, mercury because they're feeding on all that, that duff material. They're, they're recycling a lot of material. And there's a lot of that everywhere. I mean, it's in the bottom of our lakes, it's in our rivers because of years of, of uh, air pollution that we've had from, from big smokestacks where they're burning coal. So a lot of that material has been deposited in Maine for years. And some of it's out there naturally as well. There's a, there's a background level. And anything that eats worms will eat crazy worms as well. So you know, there is um, some impact from that, but these reproduce so quickly that it doesn't really make a dent in them at all. And there is a lot of research being done on how to kill them. There are fertilizers that have saponins in them that will cause them to, to dry up like this. Uh, one of them is actually uh, made with main components in, in Walderboro, Ocean Organics. It's called Early Bird. It's made from uh, tea seed. It's a tea seed meal. They're making an oil out of the tea seed and then what's left behind is put into this fertilizer and it's high in the saponins, which are kind of soapy, you know, uh, surfactant type material. So when they're applied as a fertilizer, they use these in golf course situations where they have lots of earthworms on a golf course that are causing problems and it will make them all come to the surface and they'll be all irritated and, and end up drying out and, and dying that way. So there is, you know, research going on on that out in uh, Wisconsin as well as they're trying to look at, are there you know, certain things you can do with heat or freezing? Let's say they, they get into some soil or into some compost or something like that and you wanna try to keep them from proliferating, that might be one way to take care of them. The big problem though is with the cocoons, they, they tend to be resistant, both to heat as well as to cold. So, you know, we're, talking to nurseries a lot that, you know, one of the programs that I manage is the, the nursery inspection program. We license everybody that sells plants. So for two years now, we've been trying to educate them about these worms and how to find them in the nursery. And we're looking for them as well because we inspect all the nurseries. And then if they do find them to try to figure out a way to, to, to manage them and keep them from getting into uh, other plants that then get moved around to, as we always say, stop or slow the spread. It seems like with all of these invasive things, pretty much none of them can be eradicated. So our drop back is always, let's do whatever we can to stop them from spreading or slow down the spread, just like we're gonna do with, with emerald ash borer. So it's great that you're you know, here to get educated about them. It's something that you know, if you do find um, 
what you think might be jumping worms. You can send us pictures and we can help you know, get them identified for you if we think it's important to do that. Um, you can also, there's a, a, a program that you can get on the computer. Uh, it, it's called IMAP Invasives where you can report invasive species of all kinds, including these, these uh, crazy worms. It's run by the Maine Natural Areas Program. Uh, Nancy Olmstead, that actually lives down here in Brunswick is the person that manages that, that database in Maine. It's, it's, an, it's a national program that many, many states use. And it's one way that you can report them. Basically, if you report an invasive species, then someone will probably contact you to come and actually identify to make sure that that's what it is. If you give a good enough picture for some things, it's automatically identified. But with these worms, unfortunately, they're hard to speciate. So, you know, it, it may take the, uh, the there is a, a Jason, I can't think of his last name, that works for Maine Natural Areas Program that has become a, a worm expert. And he can, he can do the uh, ID, at least for the Amenthus species. I Justin. mean, the Amenthus uh, genus. Justin Schwab. Justin, yes. Thank you. Um, and he did a, a very good paper on the worms, um, you know, a couple of years ago. So, you know, basically you can, you know, make sure that you're um, only selling plants and purchasing plants that are maybe free of jumping worms, or at least somebody is, um, you know, paying attention to that. And, you know, basically the same thing goes for compost. You know, make sure that if you are going to buy compost, hopefully it's gone through a, a rigorous heating um, you know, regimen that hopefully maybe will take care of pathogens and maybe take care of the cocoons. And uh, you know, hopefully that reduces that potential. And the other thing is, is you know, people that are working in areas, you want to arrive clean and leave clean, basically. So you're not spreading all kinds of different things other than worms, pathogens or, or other, uh, other types of invasive species. And then, you know, buying certified soil or mulch or compost and, and knowing the origin for that is another way to, you know, basically help to reduce the potential spread. So as I mentioned, uh, IMAP Invasives is a place where you can, you know, basically log invasive species, including, you know, these uh, invasive worms. And, you know, we'd, we'd like to know, you know, what's the extent of the potential of those worms. And that helps us um, with that. And you know, as, as I mentioned already, a lot of research is being, doing, being done in Wisconsin and Vermont. Uh, Michigan Tech is just getting started. And you know, I've got lots of, of references if anybody um, has interest in those. And that's pretty much all I came prepared for. So if you've got questions or if you want me to cover other topics, I can do that too. You mentioned that, that one way, the product that brings the worms to the surface and dries them out and so on. Wouldn't that kill any kind of, I mean, that would go kill any kind of worm? That'll kill any kind of worm, yeah. It'll, it'll basically well, bring up any kind of worm. Specifically at this time. No, it is not. It's not a specific uh, uh, product. It's going to affect all earthworms. And arthropods? It's going to affect some arthropods, but not as much as earthworms. Earthworms seem to be the most affected by it. But it certainly is going to get arthropods that are very um, soft bodied and wet bodied because that's going to get into their system and, and irritate them as well. So, you know, I'm not advocating that we start applying that all over the place. I'm just saying that that's one thing that they're looking at where you might have natural areas that need to be protected. So if it starts to get into a forest that you, you, you is a real preserve where you don't want invasive species to get in, that might be an alternative way of, of trying to manage them is to, to use those, um, those fertilizers. Yes? Um, I know that redworm <coughs> euphotide is not on the state's prohibited list like the Amanthus agrestis is. Um, so you can own them legally in the yes, state. Yes, you can. Are you, but they also get into the topsoil. So are you, are you concerned about those as well? Uh, we're less concerned about those because they don't do as well over the winter. So it's, it's not as big of a, an issue with them. So you don't have an issue with people raising worms? Don't have an issue with people raising worms as long as they're not just letting them out into the forest. Because if they're raising worms and they've got contamination from amenthus worms, then that's, that's a big issue. You know, that's, that's something that we definitely want to prevent. And the agrestus doesn't get killed by the cold like the river. No, the agrestus doesn't get killed by the cold at all. The cocoons can um, survive in, in northern Canada as well. So 
yeah, it, it's not something that is going to be controlled by, by cold weather here in Maine. Not, not at all. I mean, they're surviving just fine in Minnesota and, and northern Vermont, and so it's, you know, as cold or colder than here in Maine. I, I might have missed something as I was filming, but <clears throat> all of our worms are invasive, right? All of our worms are invasive. So, but not all of them are crazy. There's a couple of, few different kinds. These are just some of the worst. Is that what you're saying? The, the crazy worms seem to be right now the ones that are getting into the forest and chewing up the duff so quickly that there's a lot more concern about them than the other worms. But all worms are a problem in the forest. They're not as big a problem in a garden or in a meadow or a turf area. Where they're a problem is where they you know, destroy the, the soil of the forest, which is completely different from the soil in a garden or in a, in a, in a meadow. So you're not suggesting that you find out in the field or in the garden? Uh, no. But, no. it hurt, but it wouldn't hurt if we did. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, if, if, if now that we have had them for so long in certain areas that probably you've got some homeostasis there. So it, if we wanted to revert back to have all native species again, then sure, you'd want to kill them all. But so that, our animals, our fruit trees. Exactly. I mean, almost everything is, an, is a, a non-native species. All our foods and, and everything else. So, you know, I'm not advocating for that at all. But where there are a problem, and both European as well as Asian earthworms are a problem in the forest. Um, they, they, they create changes in soil structure, which makes it harder for trees to, and especially for trees to reproduce, other than through suckering or stump sprouts. So you, know, you, you lose that, that planting bed for the types of plants that grow in the forest. So see, see areas where large uh, deaths of duff might be beneficial that are the problem. Exactly, that's, that's where you know, those hardwood forests, where the, almost all the plants in those forests depend upon having that deep leaf litter. That's slowly releasing nutrients and provides the, the planting bed for almost everything that grows in that forest and, and, as well as the reproduction of the trees themselves. So you're, um, you've provided, you know, maybe that the arboretum, you've got uh, an ash stand or something. Is there other places that you've actually, I mean, is there something that you could understand what you're looking for and what you're seeing, but can, can you, are you aware of other places where this is a problem? Well, David Roke, who's the, the soil scientist for the state, who's also a forester, is really concerned because he's seen this phenomenon in a lot of places. And so he's starting to work with Justin and others to maybe go out and start doing some field work to see if that's what's causing the phenomena that he's seeing. You know, when I, I, I did a presentation um, on these at the trade show last year, and then we had a speaker at the Maine Invasive Species Network meeting last March from Vermont, Joseph Gores, who's been doing the research in Vermont. And, and Dave Roke was at that meeting. And afterwards he came up to me and said, how come we haven't heard about this before? He says, I think I've seen this all over the place. And, that, and, I, and I believe him because he's, he's an astute scientist and he's been around a long time and he's seen a lot of situations. So it's all new. I mean, you're on the cusp of it, uh, you know, having interest in it and, and learning about it because not many people know about it yet. And we want to get the word out there were a couple of uh, stories in the paper after the Maine Invasive Species Network meeting, but since then there hasn't really been much media attention. They've gotten a lot of media attention, especially in Wisconsin, where they actually have them at the U, U Wisconsin Arboretum, and they have an ecologist there that's been doing a lot of the research on them, and he's been reaching out a lot, so he's gotten a lot of, a lot of coverage on them. But as I already said, the long-term effects, they don't really know yet, you know. There's a lot of people that expect and understand or think they understand what is happening, but there's no scientific proof yet. Who named these crazy worms? Who named them crazy worms? I, my understanding from all that I've read is that it, it started 
um, where they were bringing them in for basically for, for fishing bait in Alabama where they call them Alabama jumpers. And then it, the, the new names all kind of came out of that. But they call them crazy worms because if you do see them and they're moving around, they, they're pretty crazy. They're, they're really very active. Yeah. No, they're all the same. Yeah, they're all amethyst worms. The Alabama jumpers, the crazy worms, the snake worms, they're all the same thing. Yeah, they're, yeah, I mean, it's like picking up a snake. You know, they're all over the place. Yeah. What about the maritime worm? That people, I mean, out the smell fishing in the bay, guys are digging worms down in the salt water. Those are sand worms or something? Or yeah, those are, you know, those are aquatic worms. So they're, they're completely different. And they're, are they native, hopefully? Uh, I think they are native, but I, I don't know enough about them. So don't, you know, don't hold me to that. I'm not a, a big marine species person. You know, I'm, a, I'm a plant, you know, terrestrial, <laughs> mostly. Do a little work with a, a aquatic invasives. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, but, yeah. yeah. What is the cause of the soil compaction with the worm activity? It's because you're losing all the, the organic material in the soil. So if you if you take a any soil and you take all the organic material out of it, it's going to become much denser and more compacted. That's why if you've got a clay soil or a sandy soil, the way to make that better is to add organic matter. It's not to add silt or clay to sand or, or clay or loam to... to um, Coffee grounds, castings that you describe, that's organic, isn't it? No, it, it's, it's, it, well, it's got some organic material, but it's all broken down. So it's, it's, it's not fibrous anymore. It's been through their digestive system. So it's broken down. So that's another reason why, as soon as it gets wetted down, it, it, it you know it loses that pulse of nutrients and then becomes a, a, a denser, more compacted soil. Yeah, it's losing all its aeration. Yeah, exactly. Which is, you know, with your deep earthworms, they're creating aeration because they're making big tunnels that go deep down into the soil. So they're making it easier, a more friable soil for roots to, to penetrate. These guys don't do that. They're right at the surface. And that's, that's another reason why there's a lot of concern about what they do to the soil structure. Question. Yes? You're rocking my world here, because uh, I'm one of those people who goes out of the yard, talks to the worms, and, <laughs> and, 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 and you may have said this, but I, but, I, but I think I missed it. Do the crazy worms hurt, kill, injure, interbreed with our friendly worms? The, the Asian worms don't interbreed with the European worms, okay. but what has been seen in multiple places, I mean, they've, they've shown crazy worms in sugar maple forests to move 13 acres a year. So they, they cover 13 acres a year, and they dominate as far as they eat up all of the material that's there for you know, worms to eat primarily, so they're chasing away the European earthworms. It's like those bees. So again, in the forest, you know, let me be really clear, in the forest, there are no good earthworms. Okay, got it. There are no good earthworms. If they're in the forest, they're not good. If they're in your garden, not so bad. And that's why it's so important to keep them from, from getting into the forest. So you don't, you know, dump your compost in the forest or you don't take your fishing bait and dump it out in the forest or something like that. Yes? In the native land, do they have any predators? Well, that will always be something that, you know, potentially if, if it turns out that these are going to cause a lot of problems, I'm sure that that's where a lot of scientists will turn is are there biological controls? And sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. Do we know if they what habitats they prefer? If they're out in the field and you got woods over here and they gonna sort of like quickly eat their way through the field to, to get to the woods because there's more of a varied diet there or in the same field or they want to be where there's a lot of organic material. So probably they're not gonna do so well in a field, but they're gonna do well where you've got leaf litter coming down, so it's gonna be a deciduous forest. I mean they do they have been known to be problems in golf courses, in fairways, but not as much as the European earthworms. They've also been known to be problems in shrub beds. 
especially shrub beds that have mulch. So, you know, you get a load of mulch that's got the worms in it, and you keep feeding them mulch, and they just, you know, they do well there, and they, and they, and they mess up your soil. I mean, and you lose any of those shallow rooted plants, those are the ones that get hurt the most. You can bait them that way then, huh? <laughs> yeah, we'll put out little piles of mulch to get them to crawl into. It sounds like we need all that organic material, not because they get real big, but to multiply. Oh, absolutely, it's their food source, so they, they've got to have that in order to, so to survive. Right, and they just move along and, and you know, it's, it's like the emerald ash borer. They, they run out of trees and then they move on and, you know, find the next batch of ash. How long do they live? It's a 60-day life cycle, but they, they only live a, a year. I mean, the, the, pretty much they all die over the winter, but the cocoons are there and and they, they come back in the, in the spring. Mm -hmm. So you get two generations in, in most areas, but um, you know, the, the adults don't make it through the winter. Mm -hmm. I have a little trouble reconciling all this. Um, I've raised red bulbs. I've got yeah. 30,000 in my basement. I've sure. I've put across 12 bins. And, and when we call a worm invasive a red worm, and, but, and you're not worried about it. I think it scares people. Even in here, you can tell you know, some of the questions. That we, it's like all worms are bad, and yet the state's not saying that red worms shouldn't be gone. And I mean, I'm an advocate for every house in America having a worm bin because if you put your kitchen waste into a worm bin, the amount of carbon and methane that's released in the atmosphere is considerably less than a compost pile, or certainly a dump. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with, with people having red worms as long as they're not contaminated with other worms and as long as they keep them inside. Okay. Yeah, that's as long, you know, it's, it's just like any other pet or other species that we have that really should be kept inside. You know, people let their cats out but really shouldn't, you know, because cats kill tons of, of animals, you know, every year they're, they're incredibly invasive and and harmful to the environment. But um, we let people have cats and we let them put them outside. Um, with, with red worms, again, if they're, they're kept where they're supposed to be and they're not contaminated with, with some of these other worms that will survive really well out in the forest, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, part of my job is to do phytosanitary certificates and you know, certify people to bring all kinds of things into the state. So I, I see, you know, people bringing in all kinds of things that probably shouldn't necessarily be here, but I know that they have a process to keep it where it's supposed to be and not let it out. And as long as that happens, I don't have any problem with it. I'm related to worms, the snails. I mean, we've had slugs for a long time, but I don't know how long ago it was, six, eight years ago. Started, the snails started to show up in gardens. Oh, there's a lot of invasive snails. That's something that we're looking for all the time and, you know, trying to identify the problems. A lot of them are already established. Many of them came from China, just like a lot of the invasives that we're getting now are coming from Asia because of all the worldwide shipping. So it's, uh, it's, it's a tough job. The, the Border Patrol works with us and works with the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and they're all pretty well trained, but the amount of stuff that comes in, you know, it's impossible to look at it all. So they've got a, a pretty cool risk-based system that they use to try to figure out where the, the problems might lie to look for things like this. And they, you know, they prevent a lot of it, but they're never gonna prevent it all. Uh, in fact, we just found um, a new slug, which there is one recording of it back in 1909 or something like that on Vinyl Haven and we don't know if it was truly that species. It's called Arion, A-R-I-O-N, Ater, A-T-E-R. And um, it's black, so it you know, stands out and it's big. And they found one this, this summer on Vinyl Haven again. We actually found four or five of them when we went out to look for them. But so far, you know, people aren't reporting that they're having a lot of plants eaten by them, so we don't necessarily think that they're gonna be a problem. They're gonna be doing what they call a pest risk analysis at USDA to try to figure out, you know, should we actually do more work to find them and see if they might 
you know, come off the island and become a big problem. But, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that we work on all the time, is trying to figure out who are the invasives that are here, how much risk do they pose, and what should we do to try to either slow them down or control them, and, you know, in some instances. The spotted lanternfly is one that you may or may not have heard before, but that, can, that might be coming to our, our area very soon. Hopefully it can't overwinter here. I suspect that it will. It seems to like just about anything. And it has to, so far they think it has to reproduce on Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, which we don't have a lot of in Maine. There is some in Southern Maine, but that's yet to be determined as well. They, they attack grapes and apples and maples and they, they're kind of like the brown marmorated stink bug. They'll, they'll eat anything. We don't know what they can reproduce on, but they seem to want to eat anything. Um, so, Mike, when you say invasive, you're, that's, you're not referring to non-native. You make a distinction between non-native species and invasive species? Yeah, there's all kinds of non-native species that aren't invasive because they don't tend to get out into the environment. They, they kind of stay in either man-disturbed areas or they stay where you plant them. You know, something like a, a Norway maple is invasive because it spreads everywhere. You, you plant it here and it shows up miles away. Um, something like a, a European beech doesn't. You know, it, it just doesn't have that capacity to, to reproduce. Like, and it doesn't fit all those niches that the Norway maple does. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, all the worms are non-native in Maine. And all of them are bad in the forest. That's what I'll say. All white people are non-native in Maine, too. That's right. Well... All, all people are non-native to Maine, right? I mean, there weren't any people here at first, but... <laughs> well, in this country, non-native means 